thank you for coming to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I'm the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experience at the museum. This is our last program of 2021. Welcome back to those of you who have joined us before. This virtual series features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of our collection that you can experience from the comfort of your home. And we plan to continue these programs regularly. So if you have a show to share that fits our museum mission, let me know. That'd be anything about Pennsylvania, yeah. the trolley era, our cities where, um, or cities where our streetcars come from. And if you have a program that doesn't quite fit those guidelines, feel free to reach out anyway. And you can see the full list of upcoming presentations at our website, which I can share in just a few minutes. It's patrolley.org. I'll put it in the chat box here. Um, and I wanna extend a special thank you to those of you who donated during the registration process tonight and to those of you who have made donations through our website. We truly appreciate your support of our virtual outreach programs. Now, for those of you who might be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway uh, by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And the museum opened to visitors a few years later in 1963 and is located along the route of the trolley line between Pittsburgh and Washington. You'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars here, about 20 of which operate on a four mile scenic ride. And we have about 30,000 visitors a year who take the, the uh, ride here at the museum. And our latest news is that our Santa trolley event is fully sold out. Um, we will still be open on Fridays December in December up until the 17th for trolleys and toy trains. Um, and then after Santa Trolley, we will close for the season and open back up just before Easter. Okay, so now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Mike Salagi and Andrew McGinnis. Andrew was born in 1935 in Philadelphia. He began his career as a draftsman at Pennsylvania Department of Highways and then worked 38 years at the Southeastern Pennsylvania Transportation Authority. Andy is an acknowledged historian and trolley restoration expert. His carefully researched and impeccably drafted trolley car blueprints are a resource for scale modelers and transit historians alike. Mike was born in Philadelphia in 1961. He has worked as a draftsman, designer, and as a planner of pedestrian facilities and bike trails. Mike is the author of Bucks County Trolleys, released in 2020, and co-author with Andy McGinnis of Montgomery County Trolleys, published in 2018. Mike resides in North Wales, Pennsylvania, where he serves as chair of the Borough Historic Commission. Um, again, at the end of the presentation, we will have a question and answer session with our presenters, but the chat box will be open, so please feel free to enter questions and comments during the show, and we can read through those at the end. And just to note, this program will be shared on our YouTube uh, whenever I'm able to edit and uh, edit it and get it up there. So please keep your microphones muted and your videos turned off during the presentation so that our presenters have all the bandwidth and so there's no accidental interruptions. I will invite you to turn those back on at the end. All right, Mike, take it away. Thank you, Kristen. We share screen here. This started. Is that showing up? Yep, I see it. Okay, fantastic. I see it, it's good. Great. I've been working the last several years for the Schuylkill River Greenway, and they're the folks that are putting the Schuylkill River Trail um, up through Berks and Schuylkill counties mostly on the uh, abandoned Pennsylvania Railroad Schuylkill Division, but that's not available everywhere. We're also using pieces of Reading up towards Frackville. So as I was working on that, I also grew curious about trolley rights of way. And one thing led to another, and I am no expert on Schuylkill Railways, but I have found some information that might be of interest. Started here. Start with an 1856 map, Canals and Railroads, just to get us situated. The text is a little bit small, so here are some labels, the relevant cities. And the coal fields, first or southern field, 
centered around Pottsville, second or middle field around Shenandoah, and third or Wyoming field, which is around Wilkes-Barre and Scrim. And this map shows that the Schuylkill Railways, which is about a 45 mile system, it was mostly in the second or middle field and eventually reached down into the first or southern field. The system started out as the Manoy City, Shenandoah, Girardville, and Ashland Electric Railway. And here's a couple of newspaper articles about the beginnings. Apparently in 1891, this electric street railway was booming. Also like the uh, title of the uh, article that showed up in York, I guess it was state news, York is 100 miles south, and they called it a mammoth electric railway, one of the longest electric railways in the state. And for 1891, it really was, that was true. This wasn't an electrified horse car line. This was a, an all new interurban system. Here's a more detailed map showing the namesake cities plus Frackville, which was reached later. It's a more clear version of the map. And we'll go through and show when the different segments were opened. Things had to be phased in. April 1892 was the first section, Shenandoah to Girardville. Later that year, Manoy City to Manoy Plain opened and the system was disconnected. The next system or next uh, section to be opened was actually Center Street in Ashland. And again, the system was not connected yet, but it would be. But 1893, the connection was made Ashland to Girardville extended west from Ashland to Locustdale, and a link was put in in April of 93, and that's the actual original system as envisioned. Lakeside Railway opened in 1894 and was very soon under the same management, although the lines were not connected at either end. In 1914, this connection from Wigan Junction up to Shenandoah was placed and it was almost entirely on private right-of-way. This was in preparation for the line south to Pottsville, which had been envisioned for a decade or more. 1916, that entered service from St. Clair on down. Schuylkill Railways cars had, tr had trackage rights over East Penn. East Penn actually built a new short line from Pottsville to St. Clair for this, for this service. And also kept their old long line through Port Carbon in service. Here's a connecting line, Chamoka to Mount Carmel Electric Railway, which actually, this is a little bit out of sequence. They hooked up in 1900 and their, their cars would run down the length of Center Street in Ashland to third. Here's a short timeline kind of concise, um, give you some sense of when things happened. 1890, Manoy City, Shenandoah, Girardville, and Ashland Street Railway Company formed. 1892, Schuylkill Traction Company, that was a reorganization. 1897, the Lakeside Railway was leased, although apparently that would be approved by the board for another three years. 1905, Schuylkill Railways Company, another reorganization. Schuylkill Railways was the name that held for most of this line's existence. 1916, long-awaited trolley service to Pottsville inaugurated. A line to Tamaqua was envisioned for, for many years. In 1922, instead of a trolley, a bus line was placed in service from Manoy City through Lakeside Park to Tamaqua. Ironically, the Lakeside Railway never reached Lakeside Park. Rather than build east to Lakeside Park, they thought they would build west to Shenandoah first, and that's as far as they got. There was labor, tr labor trouble many times throughout the line's history. In 1927, the carmen went on strike and they never came back. 1928, buses were substituted for the trolleys, but the more modern cars, there were eight cars that were still in good condition, uh, double truck uh, brills, 
steel bro cars to 1930 and 1953 that small fleet of cars served in omaha nebraska so they they served in nebraska longer than they did in schuylkill county so what's the deal anthracite there's a photograph of uh underground here's here's the backbreaking dangerous work of extracting it another photograph Huge complexes were built around the landscape um, to process, clean, and sort the coal. This is an interesting photograph, also. The largest, um, supposed to be the largest yard in the world, St. Clair Yard, built by the Redding with a complete roundhouse. Um, this, this aerial photograph was made in the 30s, so the car lines were not running at this time. But when they were running, uh, two lines would have been in this photograph. The short line, the new short line from Pottsville came in from the left and the old long line, Pottsville through Port Carbon came in to St. Clair from the right. I had this postcard up for a long time before I finally coughed up the dough for it because it's such a great picture. It's car 308 in Ashland. You're looking up from 7th Street and it just shows how prosperous the towns were when, when coal was king. And it's interesting too, because it's a modern, uh, well, we probably people call this modern, <laughs> the 19 late teens uh, steel brill car with high speed trucks, which meant 40 miles an hour, more or less. And photographs of those cars in service are pretty rare. So this is a really, really sharp postcard. You can see there are two wires above the street. It's because the Shimokin and Mount Carmel line had its own power. Another scene of uh, the coal miners where they would relax after work. It's a 1930s photo. And kids grew up in the patch towns. And here's a photo that I got recently. And Gene Gordon is credited with, with the photo, the late Gene Gordon. And this was in the late Jimmy McHugh's collection, which George Gula scanned, and George was so kind as to allow me to use the scan. And it's a neat photo because, again, it's, well, this is the newest car, one of the two newest cars on the system, 1923. And at the top of the hill in the background is Girardville. And if you go there now, it's all wooded. You would never recognize the place. And that's, that's the fact with a lot of Schuylkill County. It's changed so radically. First, it was changed by the coal mining. Um, in a brutal fashion in, in a lot of places and then left alone either to get overgrown or in some places um, mine restoration has been completed. So this little chapter is about the trolley cars themselves. These are the last two new cars built. Apparently they've been built in 1920 um, for another system in Pennsylvania and they were delivered in 23 or they were ordered in 1920 delivered in 23. So they started in 1891-92 with single truck cars. Assortment of photos. The lower left photo is in, I think it's Manoy City. No, that's Steep Hill of Center Street in Ashland. The photo on the right is Manoy City. Um, double truck cars were the next order of business, it's a convertible car. Brill seemed to be their preferred supplier. Pretty interesting track arrangement there at Woodland Park. It was midway between Ashland and Girardville. These were always placed far enough away from big towns that it would be inconvenient to walk to them. This is not actually their first park. What they called Penmar Park was about a mile behind the photographer here, but apparently it was such a hike from the trolley track up to that park that this woodland park was built to replace it. Another photograph of a double truck car. And then this line did modernize with, with steel cars. Not, not all the lines did. There's a builder's photo of the 501, 502 series. 
in the interior, one of the bro cars, arch roof car with coal stoves, of course. And tour the system a little bit. We can't get everywhere, but we can we can see some places. Locustdale was the west end of the line. And it was a small town. However, there was a huge employer there, which was the Potts Colliery, within walking distance of where the car line ended. Uh, the car line ended across the street from this wonderful old general store that had been built around 1860. And it remained in business, I believe, until the 1970s, 80s. And uh, I went looking for it. That's all there is today. But across the street is where the car line ran on the left side, the north side of the highway toward the rest of the system. Um, moving over to Ashland, this is at the top of the hill. The Shimokan Mount Carmel cars came down 21st Street, which was a paper street at the time. And there's an old aerial photo that actually shows the black patch in the pavement, which was the connection between the two lines. Um, old Sanborn maps show how the Mount Carmel cars got over the railroad that used to be where the stop sign is in the photograph in the, the bottom right. I think that was the LV. Um, yeah. So right at this point, Actually, even before this point, the road kind of goes downhill here, but the, um, uh, the the wooden trestle, you know, gained altitude and, and crossed over at this point. Pretty interesting picture, 1903. Um, supposed to be near Shenandoah on the way up to uh, Centralia. Um, cool thing about this is we actually have the back of this postcard where someone is writing about what happened thought you would be interested and anxious to know about road. That turn of phrase makes me think maybe this was an employee of the trolley line, I don't know. No one was killed, but few slightly shaken up. Great excitement when the news reached Ashland. Everybody left work and was out on the street. And the name, I can't quite make out there. Maybe someone can read the handwriting, it runs off the bottom of the card, the person's name who sent this. Sent to Mrs. R. D. Heaton, Bellevue, Stratford, South Broad Street, Philly. You can see the postmark, October 7, 3. I found the right of way and I hiked part of it. Um, of course, in the fall, it's good to wear blaze orange, which I did. Um, this is part of the lands owned by famous Reading Outdoors. So on weekends, there'll be ATVs and mini bikes tearing up and down this right of way. So where the, you know, Shenandoah is off to the left of this curve. That might be the spot where the where the thing rolled off. I don't know. Back to this card again. Gas pump on the right. I like that all the people had sense to park their uh, motor cars aiming at the um, curb. So if they should uh, run away while persons in the store you know, the car won't go all the way down the street. This car sits at 16th and Walnut. Yeah. In Ashland. Andy, and we just checked this thing out back in uh, in June. What do you think about this car, Andy? Well, it looks like it was a open car converted to closed car configuration. Like, you know, they would make it ready for winter and inclement weather. It so has a close resemblance. I mean, it's hard to tell now, but it looks a lot like one of the four East Penn open cars that were enclosed. Yes, it does. I don't know if they maybe sold equipment to Schuylkill Railways or someone said that this, this thing actually ran on the Shimokin and Mount Carmel. I don't know, but it ended up here. Well, in they Africa. would kind of pass cars around occasionally if. They didn't have much use as an, another company would. They would loan or transfer them to the ownership of the other company. And yeah. that's what I think happened here. 
especially with the fires. I mean, East Penn had a bad fire. Schuylkill Railways had two big fires and lost trolleys, so they would take anything they could get. Yeah, well, the Palo Alto Corborn on East Penn had a a bad fire. And when the Brill Company was building cars for Boston on a 475-car order, uh, they sold two of the cars to the, you know, the huts or the area up there, and two of them went to Reading. So that 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 really happened. Interesting. So Brill, this would be small, Brill Company small was things. very good about doing things like that, and they didn't have any, you know, trouble if they borrowed cars off an order. So, yeah. And you you that, spoke with Powelson, who was a Brill salesman for years, right? You, so you, you heard yeah, of this yeah. first thing. Bill Powelson, oh yeah, he was a, a salesman for the Brill Company. And he started there when he was 22 years old. And he told me lots of stories how they would sell cars to another system if there was a fire or something. So, yes, that, that really happened. When I saw this um, postcard, I was really shocked. At, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, before we uh, move on from that car, George Gula says it might uh, be a Schuylkill Electric Railway car, which became East Penn Railways. That's possible, Yeah, too. that's a good that's a good possibility, yeah. Car 209, it looks like, yes. Yeah, okay, yeah. And that is uh, that car is still there, right? Because we had someone in the chat uh, share a... Google Street View image of it there. Um, and you guys took yes. this photo earlier this year, right? Yes, we did. And it's a house, right? Not a diner or anything. No, it's a, it's a full residence. Okay. It doesn't look occupied anymore. Yeah. Sad to say. When I, when I first saw this photograph of Ashland and I saw the wires up top, I thought, what, what trolley went down Third Street? I, I couldn't understand what was going on here. And it, Turns out this is where the uh, Shimokan um, Mount Carmel Centralia cars would pull off just to get out of the way of the uh, Schuylkill Railways car. Pretty neat postcard looking west into Ashland. State Highway was put right on top of this after the line was abandoned in 28. Notice the uh, kind of fancy brackets overhead. Top left there. The uh, Schuylkill Railways use those a lot. And I noticed that the uh, Lakeside Electric did not because they started out separate. Is that a river on the in the side of that, that one? Yeah, it's Manoy Creek. Yep. You can see there's houses on the other side. You know, there, there would always be a bridge or some way to get to a station, a trolley station, when there was a patch like that, including here. Some photos of Woodland Park. It's interesting, by the close of World War I, it had gone out of business, so it was super popular early on, but then it faded. Do you know what features the park had? Based on the sign here, vaudeville, dancing. And that's what's there now. Same thing in June, we drove up there to take a look. And by the 1930s, they'd already um, taken all the buildings down and put a patch town up there. This is a map that I completed recently, detailed map of Girardville showing where the tracks were. They're, they're, you know, there are some sort of surprising things here. They're not necessarily where you would expect them to be. Of course, they were last used in 1927, so there's very little left to see now. Here's a close-up of the uh, west end of town. Probably came in from private right away onto Ogden Street, Julia, Maine. And here is the east end of town. There's the car barn complex. One of the rare pictures of the steel cars in service four-car uh, four excursion 
The third car back is different if you look closely. First, second, and fourth are one type, and it could be that the third one is one of the 500 series cars, maybe. Yeah. If I went well, back and what's that, Andy? Yeah, I think it's one of the 500 series cars. Yeah. Yeah. So I went back to try to scope some of these locations out today. There's the same spot. Um, a little less interesting, I think. Lehigh Valley negatives are a pretty interesting resource. There's hundreds of them, and I looked at each one of them because some of them show up with a, with a trolley track, and some actually have trolley cars. So this is Julia Street looking north. So trolley is just curved off of Maine, went up Julia for a couple blocks, crossed the bridge, and made a big sweeping turn onto Ogden Street and left town that way. And there's the end of Ogden Street. Um, the right of way continued straight ahead from my Jeep there. And I, I was speaking, you know, there's people out raking leaves and I was speaking with a property owner right there. And he was not old enough to remember the car lines, but he, he said neighbors of his, when he moved there, there were people that still remembered everything, old timers. If you're looking east, Shenandoah cars turned left at Richard Street. Manoy City cars continued east on Main. This was the Gerard Estate Office. The Gerard Mansion was, um, still is, like behind the photographer. Again, thanks to George Gula for sharing his um, Jimmy McHugh prints. We have some pretty cool views of the car barn. Was there just the one car barn? The, yeah, this complex was the only place that housed Schuylkill Railways cars. Lakeside Electric had their own barn in Manoy City, which still stands. This, this building here in Gerardville, there's absolutely nothing left here. But the car barn, uh, the stone 1894 car barn in Manoy City is still standing and is occupied by a diesel truck mechanic. And they take really good care of that building and uh, spent a good hour talking with them and they showed us around. It was pretty cool. It's a very nice building. But this building, nothing left at all. Of actually, this whole complex of buildings. Neat photo taken out front two-story office building. Same location, just looking north. Looks like an old passenger car that's been repurposed. Old semi-convertible. And I guess this is this is morning. This is also at the, uh, this is the office. The car barn is just behind it to the left. I guess first thing in the morning, Got to knock all that snow off the top of the car, which looks deep. One of the one of the uh, modern steel uh, brill cars. Cool picture here, 1892 photo of the town of Lost Creek, and the caption says Lost Creek School Children, October 1, 1892, Lost Creek, PA. It's a neat photograph. I guess those are the teachers there and the kids all, all dressed up on an old wooden wooden bridge with a dirt road. And in the background, you can see the single track car line and you can very clearly see a passing siding. And based on the maps, right after the siding, the line made a hard left and continued west to Gerardville. And also, if you look at the right side of the picture, there are ties showing. It's where the short bridge was over the creek. And this only was in service for about 10 years. Um, rather than cross the creek and serve the town of Lost Creek and come back, uh, they straightened out the line in 1901 and abandoned that section. We got a question in the chat. What was the track gauge? The standard gauge. Thanks. So I went back well, and tried to get a photo. 
Pardon me, Annie? Annie? Four feet, eight and a half inches. Okay. So here's, a, here's the same place. We don't have blueprints of the whole system, but now and then, um, the, what the, the state of Pennsylvania has digitized hundreds and hundreds of mind maps because of the problem of subsidence and you know the occasional fire that lasts for for years, and they they've made them available online. Um, obviously, they're not tagged with anything about trolleys, so it's a very, very laborious process to open them all. They're all interesting. Most of them show subsurface, obviously, um, you know, workings in great detail. Some of them are color coded. If there are four levels of of uh, works, there'd be, you know, blue ink, red ink, black ink, and then they'll show surface features as well to varying degrees of precision. Some of them are absolutely incredible. They show every stick of rail and siding, but that's, but it's patchy. There's a couple areas up here that I am still in the dark about. So this is right near Lost Creek. It's just a little bit east of there. This was called West William Penn. And you can see how there was a net grade crossing. In fact, when this line first entered service in 1892, there were 11 grade crossings. It's pretty incredible. Most of them weren't of you know super active main lines. They might've been sightings to breakers, but still 11 is a lot. This um, Schuylkill Railways also did implement trolley freight service once the Homeshire Act was passed in 1908. And within a year, they had canceled it. And the newspaper articles just say, you know, uh, it didn't catch on. Well, a more likely reason is that if they were going to expand at all, and they were hoping to, Reading Coal and Iron owned huge swaths of land up here, and you'd have to get easements from them. And the Reading didn't like the competition with the freight. So rather than endanger future cooperation, Google Railways forgot about the freight. This is a little further east on the road. This is West William Penn. And with the houses really tight up against the road, you know, the, the car line did run right in front of these houses. In fact, the ones on the right, but somehow you crowded in your highway and single track car line right through these kind of tight um, patch towns. What this postcard because it looked to me as though that big embankment could have been a trolley line. Now, the color postcards in the early days, um, the artists hand tinted these and they really had no idea what the colors of things were. Obviously, sky is blue and you know, trees are green, but uh, most of these were done in Germany. And unless there were very specific instructions, they would um, tint things various ways. So the big coal pile there, yeah, that's black, but the, the slate wouldn't have been white, but it's okay because, you know, this is obviously um, a photograph that's been heavily retouched, but that line there on that embankment, that is, that's our car line. That's the 1892 line that was in service all the way till 1927, till the end. You can see the big bridge there. And what's interesting is there was an even bigger bridge just to the right, just outside of the frame of this um, postcard photo. And the, basically the whole line had continuous problems with subsidence. And um, there's a newspaper article about one crew that came along this line and, and realized that there was a huge gap that part of this embankment had disappeared and that one of the poles was down in there and he couldn't see the top of the pole. What's also interesting is how quickly they would rally their forces and, you know, within, you know, next morning it was in service again. And also these bridges, um, they started out as timber and they were so rickety that Shenandoah Borough condemned them and kept forcing them to first patch them up and eventually replace them with steel structures. And there's nearly the same vantage point by Dick Sheldon, who was a federal, like a public works administration photographer. He took some pretty amazing pictures. 
in this area in the 1930s. And I went out there and sure enough, here's some abutments pretty high up to where this line, you know, jumped across. And I'm standing up top there and you can see the line of piers down below. And so there would have been steel towers on those piers. It was long, it was like, uh, it was at least 500 feet long. So here are the remnants. This area is, the road there on the left is actually the old state highway that's been bypassed. And right now, that is a driveway to a sewer plant. And I was getting, I was traipsing around and photographing and the guy leaving is like, hey, you wanna get out of here now? I mean, I don't mind you in here, but I'm about to lock the gate. <laughs> so I was like, okay, time to leave. Are those rails at the bottom third of the photo there? Like yeah. perpendicular? Yes, those are those are freight. I think that I think it's the reading. One of the one of the reading's many branches. The card that I bought, nice color card, an open car. It's interesting, the trolleys did not come into Shenandoah from the west. On Center Street, they came in on Coal Street, which was a narrow little street. Even now, um, it's a narrow street, and for whatever reason, they did not come in Center. They left on Center Street, going east. That's the Lakeside Railway cars, but coming in from the west. Often, you know, in these situations, someone else had the franchise. You know, maybe that Lakeside Electric had the franchise for all of uh, Center, and that may be why. Um, Schuylkill Railways came in on Cole Street. And it's a photograph I took of the, of the center of town right there. And what you had here is Main Street runs uh, north-south and it's left to right in this photograph. And the cars, the Schuylkill Railways cars went down another two blocks to the right to Cherry Street. And there's no connection here with the, with the rest of the system. And repeatedly the management for decades, every so often we'll go before Borough Council and say, we wanna put a connector in here, it would be a good idea. And every time they did that, people who lived and the businesses on the two blocks of Main Street to the right were convinced that the cars would never run down there again to Cherry Street and they would lose their um, convenient service. So all the way from you know, the 19 aughts, all the way through the twenties, there's newspaper articles about um, the railway trying to get permission to put a switch in here and, and then being shot down every time. It's a color postcard of Manoy City um, looking east, basically, or looking southeast. And again, these hand tinted cards are cool. There's real photographic detail on them, but then, you know, there's certain things that are augmented by the artist, like the big breaker up on the hill. And sure enough, there's a single truck car in the lower right. There also had been a car barn here early on before the system was connected up. And it shows up in the 1920 um, Sanborn map. If you know Sanborn maps, they almost always leave out trolley tracks. Very seldom do they show them. Every stick of rail, if it's a class one railroad, a steam railroad will be precisely drafted, measured and drawn. If it's trolley, nope. But in this case, there's a mind map that shows Schuylkill Railway side tracks by TKS and it's in the same location. I guess the, by this time the building was gone, but you can see the track arrangement. So it's a matter of uh, just pouring through all the available stuff and seeing you know, what, what, what will mesh, what will dovetail, try to piece this back together. Question in the chat from Gary Solomon. Was the system primarily single rail? Yes. Thanks. Even the line, the new line, 1916 down to Pottsville. And there was a couple head-ons. One was, one involved fatalities on that line, even though there were um, passing sightings and signals, you know, humans are <laughs> fallible. And it, it, there's a newspaper article about um, giving the management's side during one of the strikes, there were several. And management is like, well, your carelessness wrecked four good steel cars. <laughs> They're yelling at the guys for all of them for, for someone's mistake. So this is the old state highway west out of Manoy City. It's been bypassed. 
Cole's Patch was the name of it. So underneath this asphalt, you've got an 18 foot wide cement road and that right shoulder where the, where the car line was that makes convenient parking today. So there are many abandoned little stretches like this that are pretty interesting. In 1922, there was a big um, full spread um, newspaper piece about a Schuylkill Railways. That's that's pretty neat. It's like a history of the line up to 1922 and a bunch of photos. And that's where this picture of Wigan Junction was. So that's their substation there, and there's a waiting room right next door. And this was put here in 1914 when the new lines were put in, 1916. So basically you had the east-west line and the north-south line. And this is not only could you transfer at this point, and the cars were timed to transfer here at least for some years. Very nearby within walking distance was Pennsylvania Railroad Passenger Station also, which was an alternative when something happened to the car lines if the power was out or whatever. So Wigan Junction was an important transfer point. And again, I've been out there and there's absolutely nothing there. Part of the reason is the state highway that goes past this site had a big bow in it. And I think around 1940, they straightened it out and it went straight through these buildings, which had already not been used for over a decade, so another great color postcard of a um, breaker. Now, this is the old Nicholas breaker. The Reading would build a gigantic one, like one of the biggest in the world, nearby later. And so you've got the road, kind of the dirt road on the left side there, the road um, that went west out of Manoy City. But if you look really closely, you can see a 700 foot long trolley trestle with ornate um, supports for the wire. And that was another thing that started out as wood and just kind of wore out and they replaced it with steel. So this system had a lot of, um, a lot of structures. And about that opening um, uh, piece of artwork, it, it, I, I think it's really beautiful. It, it was sketched in 1910 by Joseph Pennell, the American artist. And he he wrote in, I guess, in a note about where and when he did this. And I'll, I'll read it briefly. He says, one afternoon hunting for subjects, I took the trolley from Manoy City in the sunset to Shenandoah. So that would have been the Lakeside Electric to Shenandoah. And as we breasted a hill, this is what I saw. The long lines of crosses our trolley poles, the huge castle, a coal breaker, the great town American, but the people, the miners who go to those churches which crown it, speak languages and worship creeds I do not know nor understand. Those are Pennell's words. So I've tried to find exactly where this was because we have mind maps that show pretty much everything on the Lakeside Electric. There's even places where it was um, relocated around Gatesville. Um, cause things had to constantly be shifted as the, uh, as the coal mining operations moved and they had to pile things somewhere or dig somewhere else. Even the class one railroads got moved around and the trolleys did too. So I, I was not able to pin this down. And also it looks like he may have exaggerated, you know, the height, which is cool. Like the, uh, some of the spires in, in Shenandoah maybe. Uh, I wasn't able to line it up exactly when I was out there at sundown trying, trying to, trying to scope it out. The nearest I got was, uh, well, I want to explain a little more first. Here's why it's so hard to locate places. This is, uh, this is a piece of ground, obviously heavily, heavily uh, <laughs> uh, resourced. Uh, 1938 aerial. By this time, the trolley had been abandoned, but, but you could still see where it ran in different places. And I've plotted it out by overlaying other maps. You can see where it came in, it kind of hooked around a breaker, top left. And then it came in from the backyards of Jackson's Patch and shifted into the street in front, which would be great for the people who live there, have trolley service. Um, and what's remarkable about this is, you know, I, I use GIS, so we're locked into the same location. Here's the same place in 2018. Um, it's, it's good that, you know, mine reclamation has happened here, but it, 
there's nothing recognizable. Even the the road, the alignments are different. Um, so <laughs> some places it's really hard to see what was what. Um, a lot of places in Schuylkill County. So this just illustrates the challenge of trying to um, match locations. So I tried to match that location, and the closest I could come was this this power line right away, which is nearby, near Yatesville, um, just a couple days before Thanksgiving, the one just passed. Um, Andy, do you want to say something about Harry Fazig? Harry looked to be 105, and you were good friends. Yes. Well, Harry had uh, good recall of everything, and he documented it with his sketches and his paintings. Harry was a genius, and he, and he preserved a lot of stuff. He wrote three books, and he, he really had good recall on things. Uh, he, he was fortunate enough to be born in 1897, so he remembers the trolley lines being built as a child, and he died in 2003. He wrote yes, Montgomery yes. County, or Trolleys of Montgomery County, Trolleys of Berks County, and he co-wrote Trolleys of Bucks County with um, Barker Gummery, and these Harold are published Cox? by the late Harold um, Cox. Barker Gummer. yeah, yeah. So what, was it Thursday nights yeah. you'd always hang out? Oh yeah, we would always get together on Thursday nights, and... Harry would tell me stuff and show me stuff, and he'd make sketches, and he was a genius. I mean, he really was on on recall and all kinds of things like that. So a lot of his stuff is still preserved in the North Wales area. Well, he was a he was a draftsman too. So you, you and, and yes, I mean, well, an illustrator really. His work was incredible. Yours is too. It's very precise, and you had that in common. I, yeah, um, well, he he and I would go over stuff. I'd dig up things from the state highways, files that only I knew where they were because they were so ancient. And then he and was I able would, to draw his trolley maps based on the highway drawings that you, you found. Yeah, yeah, I was. Right. And I helped them put a lot of them together, which we still have, fortunately. We wouldn't have if Harry and I hadn't gotten together and thought to preserve them. Yeah, and you had a good boss at the uh, Department of Highways who said, oh, we don't need that. If you if you want to take that with you, you can yeah. take that role. <laughs> Stuff Water, during the Water 1920s. Boots, <laughs> they used to let me have the old drawings, and Harry and I would go over them. And, of course, what as a state sometimes it retain them. But, you know, there's no sense of preservation anymore. It's disgusting. Mm. I mean... Stuff that should have gone to preservation didn't. Fortunately, when we cleaned out the attic at Haverford, I sent the stuff to Harrisburg up to the State Museum Commission, and it's still on file there. Oh, you said about the Delaware Canal? You you made sure that went well, to Delaware, the state? Delaware Canal, we had all the drawings, and they were going to throw them out. So I made darn sure I got the State Highway Department or the, the Museum Commission to come down and take them all up and put them under preservation. So they were saved. Thank goodness. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, there, there's a book of Harry's. I, uh, that, uh, his, his Berks County book was. Um, I have a copy of his Berks County book where he went through it and he redlined it. He marked up. Things I guess that he caught that maybe the editor had changed, or it's a, it's a really neat copy of his book, and almost every page has some. You know, his his Montgomery County book has 400 footnotes in it, which is incredible for a book like that. Every yeah, newspaper well, Harry, that he looked at. Harry would, uh, you know, if he thought something that Cox or somebody else overlooked, he'd put it in there. Yeah. So this book, the very last page of the Berks County book, is a picture of the last day of trolleys in Reading, which is 1952 or three. January 7th, 1952. So it, next to that photograph, he wrote. He 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 thought about it and he and he wrote this, which I scanned out of his book. 
who wrote uh who wrote from a psalm 103 or 16. yes he wrote for the wind passeth over it and it is gone and the place thereof shall know it no more i thought that was i thought it was appropriate oh yeah well and that's all i got yeah harry Harry was very, very keen on stuff, and so he was good. I mean, now he would sometimes contradict the other people, but he was right because he was there, they weren't. So, you know, I gave a lot of credit to Harry. So, but... um, Yes, he, he he did a very good job of uh, you know making making captive the stuff that he saw when he was younger. Actually, I just realized he wrote four books. There's the three county books, and then he did the the book on uh, real deck roof cars, where he really delved into how they were put together, the carpentry and the whole the whole uh, oh yeah his, like, the car builder's art. Well, Palson could help out on that, too. But he went to Brills when he was 22 years old, and he stayed there through the 50s into the bus era and the track Australia thing. So Palson, in his own right, also had good recall on things. Bill Palson. So, you know, they were both my good friends, and uh, I learned a lot from them. So, Great. being a latecomer, so, you know, but thank God we had Palson and we had, uh, Co- well, Cox helped too, so not to discount him on anything either, so, but, uh, yeah, I mean, Fazig and, well, Barker Gummer knew some stuff too, but then, I don't know, he and Cox and they would get into some disputes on things which I stayed out of because I was around to see it. So that was wise. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know. Sorry to uh, but, to, to uh, butt in, but um, I saw the the screen share stopped, so I threw up uh, the next slide on my end here. Um, that was a wonderful presentation, an awesome mixture of history and anecdotes, and then and now photos. Um, I really appreciate you putting that that together. And Andy, I appreciate your commentary as well. And uh, we'll get into a question and answer session here in just a second. But before we do, um, I want to let our viewers know that we do have some other programs coming up. Uh, Our first of 2022 will be the Isle of Man Transport System from Ian Longworth, who is actually the Director of Transport Services there. And just to note, it will be at 6 p.m. because Ian will be five hours ahead of us. So he's going to start it at 11 p.m. his time, which is uh, really generous. And February 9th, we'll have another presentation from Matt Nahn and Harry Donahue called uh, PCC Car 2168, A Streetcar Survival Story, which will kind of explain the history or or the um, process of saving a car and and what makes it a good candidate to preserve and restore and and all of that. And you can see all those again at patrolley.org. Registration will be available for that January program within the next couple weeks or so. And then another note. 2168 was used a lot on the Willow Grove line. Yeah, and yeah, they will tell us all about that. Um, and I, a note for people attending this program that uh, might be interested in the Western Pennsylvania Trolley Meet, which will be June 3rd and 4th, 2022, which is a Friday and Saturday. We'll have um, models, we'll have a swap meet, we'll have a trolley parade, and should be a lot of fun. And Friday and Saturday will actually coincide with anything on wheels, where we invite, um, you know, classic cars, fancy trucks, um, a tiny house on wheels, all sorts of things to the museum that weekend. Um, And I just want to thank everybody again for coming today. If you enjoyed the program, please consider making a donation at patrolley.org slash support. Um, I will share that in the chat in a few minutes. 
And thank you again to those of you who donated during the registration process for tonight's program. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you again to Mike and Andy. And uh, let me get into some questions now. Um, some really nice, some really nice comments uh, coming in. Let's see. George Gula asked, uh, what are the addresses for the Lehigh Valley Railroad negatives and the mind map site? Any ideas there? I can send mm. I can send links around. There's yeah. there's several. There's more than one. Okay, and I'm going to allow participants to unmute themselves. So um, if you do have a question, feel free to hit unmute and you can ask it directly. Um, I had a question actually to start things off. Um, what, what was the fleet size of the Schuylkill Railways? Like how many cars did they have? Hmm. It wasn't real big. Yeah. A couple dozen. Might have okay. been more earlier on than late. Yeah, and then some of them got sold secondhand to the Midwest. Like, would, would some of those cars have gone to Omaha? Yes, they did. That's, that's what I thought. Yeah, and they lasted in Omaha till February 1954. So they did serve a long after service from when they disappeared from the scene here. Yeah, they were a question were, about uh, Barker Gummery that you guys mentioned, who wrote the books about the uh, trolley lines around the area I live, like Trenton and and um, the Pr Trenton area. Did um, there's a house in Princeton off of Library Lane that is supposedly it's the last name is Gummery. It's one of these really big houses there. Is that the same person? Yeah, that I, I, would be. Possibly. Uh, um, I, I know that he was um, he was part of a, a large family. I think his great uncle was uh, like the chief justice of, of the state in Trenton. Oh, um, okay. But I, I don't know about current um, relatives for sure. And how long ago did he uh, did he pass? It's a good question. I mean, I can, I can look it up. Oh, okay. Into the eighties, I would believe. Two, two thousand nine. Oh, two thousand nine. Okay. Because yeah. he did, he did uh, quite a number of the books for that for this area. Yeah, he did. He was very thorough. He, actually, he had a degree in history from Princeton, so he was oh. not, he was not your average like. Um, you know, hobbyist like I am, he, was, he, had, um, he had credentials and was very thorough in his work. Yeah, you can see some of the rights of way around here if you know where you're looking. It's interesting how trolley rights of way sort of end up, you know, they, they, they seem to last, you know, 50 to 100 years after the trolley line is long gone. What often happened is if they're on private right of way, um, the utility company would buy it. Not always. Well, but, well the then, fast line between Newark and Trenton is is a it was public service and it is a utility line. I noticed that there's a move afoot to put a bike trail on there, and they're calling it the, the Johnson Trail in honor of you know the guy who uh, hmm. was uh, behind the Lehigh Valley Transit who actually was trying to build a line to New York, which never really panned out. I think he bought the Calhoun Street Bridge and. A couple other pieces for this empire, but he never completed it. So I thought it was interesting yeah, that using the, that, the Johnson uh, Trail. Some of that survived into 1934. In the Princeton line until 1940, I think. Yes, yeah. Yeah. And, and the abutments are still there in Stony uh, in Stony Creek uh, for the bridge, and there's a. Again, it's a it's a utility right of way. So right above the bridge is uh, our, some kind of power line goes over it in the same in the same location. Oh, nice cat. <laughs> He's gonna walk in the keyboard and God knows what combination of keys. You know, control up the leads at least no problem. <laughs> Format all. I don't know. <laughs> so have you guys come across any photos of the grade crossings? You said there were eleven, right? 
Yeah, there are photos. Yeah, I have more material that I did not add to this, just so it didn't go on for hours. But there are. That's this cat. Yeah, he's an neat cat. <laughs> uh, question in the chat: What was the name of the book about the Brill trolleys with the deck roofs? I think it's called Brill Deck Roof Cars. Yeah. By, by Harry Fazig. By Fazig, yeah. He really, uh, he, he was really fascinated with the way, you know, actually, like, I remember talking to someone years ago who said that, uh, as far as he knew, the majority of people who worked at Brills way back were cabinet, cabinet makers because the interiors were wood and, and they, everything had to, had to fit just precisely. And I had never thought of that. And, and later, well, had, I guess by the 30s, it was steel, but earlier on, they, it was woodwork. They, they had come from Germany to work for Brills to do the right. cabinet work for the inside of the wooden cars. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and this guy I, I was talking to was actually a German immigrant. Came over in the 1920s. Um, so you had that one photo of uh, it looked like a converted passenger car. Um, what other kinds of maintenance equipment did they have? They, they had a good amount. There is a roster that was prepared by the late Gene Gordon. and He actually enumerates them. He spent many, many years delving into this system. And the, and the book well, that he Brill wrote built, published, but... Brill built many of the snow sweeper cars. And the, the, besides the McGuire Cummings Company of Illinois and, uh, they built more of the snow sweeping equipment than anybody. And it, it was around like in Baltimore till 1963. So, and then Brill built the rest of it. So uh, they, they were popular for the snow sweeper cars. And Philadelphia ran their last in 1972. That was one of the arguments that were uh, speaking of non you know revenue cars um when the manager of uh the schuylkill railways went before shenandoah board and said let us put this link in for instance you know about the only thing that gets part of the street that gets cleared during a blizzard is when our trolleys come through and they go all the way up you know to center street and they can't get over and they have to go all the way around like five miles just to go to the other other corner and you know if it's a blizzard they might not might not make it. So that was one of the arguments they tried using to convince um, the borough to allow them and they never got that permission. Any other uh, comments or questions for Mike or Andrew? Yes. yes. I wonder if, if uh, you guys could uh, write a book on this particular line, definitive history, a good, nice, thick, hard bound. I think you have enough material for it. I, um, well, the, the work that Gene Gordon did was, was just incredible. I mean, he basically researched every aspect of this, of this thing. Um, I, um, it'd be nice to do it someday. I'd have to retire first <laughs> to, to set aside enough time. I'm 75. Please get to it. <laughs> My um, my neighbor, she's some passed away now, but she used to. Her mother had a dress shop in Shenandoah, and my neighbor used to ride the trolleys. And I took her over to the trolley museum of the Rock Rock Hill, and she didn't have one nice thing to say about the trolleys. And she was she told me how happy she was when they switched to buses. They must have gotten very rickety towards the end. There are photographs of what that line, uh, <coughs> some of the tracks, um, they, they were incredible. I can't believe that the car stayed in the rails. Um, they, it was ongoing maintenance headache. There's a, there's a quote um, in one of Cox's books that's similar. He said that he was used to giving talks to people at different groups and sharing reminiscences afterward. And he said one time an elderly person came up to him and he, he said he sealed himself for the usual. And she said, I hated those things. <laughs> she <laughs> uttered a couple of you know, mild swear words. Her actual comment. The four, -wheel, the four wheel dinkies. Her comment was they rode like hell. She was talking about the open cars. You're right. That's right. 
Okay. Any other um, any other questions or comments? I thought um, that the story about the two blocks of that that one road where like how I mean the connection they they never voted to make the make us uh, you said a switch right and I mean it would have been so convenient. How far did they have to go out of their way to get basically back to the same spot? Miles, <laughs> really really far. It was it was just. That's the way it worked out. They had the same problem in Manoy City at the other end. They never, again, it was like 100 yards, and they never made the link. Would you but be then, able to um, pull up the map? I think it was like uh, one of the early slides in your presentation where, I mean, it looks, you know, from far away like it's connected, but. Yeah. Um, no, I can I can do that. Yeah, I, I think to, to show people what you're talking about, just this, this little strip of businesses. Uh, and you said they were probably right. They pr probably would have. Um, by, I mean, people would have bypassed that, right? You call up the map here. Yeah. Well, Mike, in uh, what we're talking about, and I think Shenandoah, were there actually the two separate lines that were not connected? Yeah, that Lakeside Electric was a separate company that then sort of merged, but not really. Um, mm -hmm. Now, for the slideshow here, I can't zoom in because um i uh just just so the slideshow would would move um you know flow and not kind of hang up in between slides i uh i made everything um i crunched everything down as low as i could you know what i mean like in the interest of economy basically so you can see shenandoah at the right there you can see how zigzaggy the the um Lakeside Electric line was there. Lakeside Electric Railway. It, it actually did that. Like that's traced off of off of mind maps. I mean, they were trying to work their way around all sorts of facilities. You know, um, it, was, it zigged, zigged up and down. There was actually a park up there, also called High Point Park, where people would um, have you know ball games and, and picnics. Um, and um, I don't know if you can use your use your mouse to circle that. Um, yeah, that yeah. spot right there is That's not right there. actually not That's actually connected. Right. If we if we're able that we can't zoom in on this version of the map because what I did is I basically did screen grabs rather than have a live map on here just because um, it just makes the slideshow go easier. But it, it shows that it's connected, but it really wasn't. There was just you know. Also, you can see there's kind of a little horseshoe in the lakeside railway line there that little drop the, the trolley line actually um went up a, a little piece of elevated track so you can oh i should uh hold on let me share my screen instead i can sh um screen two they so can see some photos here are, are they showing up yeah Okay, these are some of the reference material. Um, oh, this is this is worth viewing right here. This is one of the Scoopful Railway's cars. That's how they ended up service 1950s. Hmm. Or not. But that's not what I wanted to show. I wanted to show Bowers Street in Shenandoah because they built an L because they couldn't cross the LV tracks at grade. The LV had a big sweeping curve there, and they thought it would be unsafe. So the transit company built, let's see if I can find the photos here. Um, Bower Street. There's no sign of it now. I went back and looked. Never know it was there, but let's see if I can find this. Hmm. Sanborn map. There's also Sanborn. Well, go to, let me go to Shenandoah. These organized by. Uh... Here's some interesting photos, right? <laughs> I know this is off, off off on a track here, but when when there were so many men at World War One, they were giving certain traditionally male jobs to women. So I thought ah. it was <laughs> these high Valley negatives. It's, it's, wow. you know, it's pretty cool. Um, they even have a photo. I don't know if this is if they just staged this, but 
there's an there's an all female track group. 1917. It's pretty interesting. Wow. Anyway, that's not what we're looking for. <laughs> we are looking for. Um, I can find this for you. Sorry for fumbling around here. Do you want to unshare and then come back to it? I am almost. Oh, Bower Street! I just saw it. Yeah. Oh no! Let us see it all. <laughs> yeah, it's great, right? I've been collecting this stuff for a while, and, but it just doesn't make for a very organized show. But uh, a lot of interesting information here. Yeah, here it is. This is this is from the Lehigh Valley Negatives. Look at that. And it went right in front of the houses. This is Oak Street, a paper street. Also, there's yeah. provision for pedestrians there. You can see the. Um... So this is after it was rebuilt, <laughs> or, or was it? Uh, anyway, it had to be rebuilt at a certain point because it would only handle little dinky single truck cars. And when they bought the big double truck grills, they had to stop them on the other end of town until they could rebuild this thing, which they did. So I'm not sure if this is before or after the. Uh... Mike, can you bring up the map? The map that you put into the and 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 zoom in on that one. Um, what format that's in? <laughs> I went through so many, I went from GIS to CAD to uh, Photoshop, trying to get it in a format that was. Yeah, um, you guys, yesterday when we had our practice session, Mike was showing me the process of lining up all these maps and modern day, like satellite imagery. And like, I, mean, I know a lot of you probably know how difficult it is, but. Um, do you, do you I, use this Esri? Was a very involved. I do. <laughs> involved. Yeah. Because we're trying to integrate stuff from so many different sources, you know, that's the thing. So this. Okay. Here's little bits and pieces. These were drawn in CAD and then they were brought into S3 and then S3 made KMLs. So there you go. <laughs> Wow. Mm -hmm. And then it's, it's this line, even even the line in 1914 was pretty roundabout. And then the, and then this alignment is incredible. <laughs> when I first saw the mind maps, I was I was pretty intrigued. They were they were dodging all these, you know, breakers and piles and you know, let alone the natural stuff that was there, which is like streams running through. Ravine. And the other railway, the other one, not Lakeside, but the other one that went down the Main Street or whatever, and then Cole Street, that that's which company? Um, that was also Lakeside. Oh, no, that was, I'm sorry, the Schuylkill Railway. Yeah, there it is. There's on Cole Street. It's so narrow. Okay. Then this was called Kohenor, where the school is now, the school complex, and the trolley actually did this. But again, Route 54 didn't do that. You know, originally the highway went like this on Center Street, went down. This is one of the few places I got yelled at when I parked. <laughs> this little, this was called uh, what's the name of this place, not Jackson. Um, anyway, I stopped there, and an old guy comes out in the porch, move your car out of my parking space. I'm like, okay, man, sorry. I said move it. <laughs> Most people are nice. If in a whole day only one person yells again, it's a good day. <laughs> He was in that house right there. So I was scoping this area out because there was actually an overpass that probably jumped over Center Street at this location. Hmm. And there is a photo somewhere of that location. The steel is gone, but you can still see the abutments. And now there's no trace of it whatsoever. Absolutely nothing. When I did finally find an out of the way place to park my car, I went back and looked. And where was that bridge that you showed um, over by the, the, I think it was in Shenandoah? Yeah, that, that's had, here. that went over the. Yep, that's here. That's this. North oh, that's South. near that the water. Yep. That's. Yes. Okay. Yep, that's where it was. You can see, you know, the town is just beyond it. Right. Hmm. So um, I found out the hard way that you can only have ten layers in Google My Maps because I had like all these layers ready to go, and it's like your limit is ten. I'm like, what? Okay, I got to combine some things. <laughs> It's a free service, so I can't complain. It seems like an arbitrary limit. So where that 
you can see where that um that photograph was taken, Lost Creek, the school kids. Right. You showed us the bridge. Yeah. That was right here. So uh, the old, the original alignment from 1892, um, like this, went up, and then it went down like this, hooked up like that. And that's, you know, obviously, <laughs> you can see where they bypassed it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, comment in the chat, there's an Omaha car preserved at the Durham Western Heritage Museum that might be a Schuylkill car. Um, does anybody know if that is the case? It was out there this year in Omaha, but I don't remember the number of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, not... Probably not a Schuylkill Railways car, says Matt Non. So he's provided some other information in the chat there. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, any further uh, comments or questions for Mike or Andrew? Uh, thank you very much. This has been great. You're welcome. I wish I could have fit more in. I have more material. <laughs> hey, there's always room for a part two, yeah. right? <laughs> I do too, Mike. I spent part of today driving around that area. On my way to isn't it? Yeah. I, I really like uh, exploring up there. Uh, uh, this time of year, just wear your blaze orange. It's still hard Actually, to find it. It's fine to find everything, but uh, not the people that inherited the uh, Redding Coal and Iron Company uh, coal lands, the Rich family, they are still actively mining some of the land, but most of it is dormant. And they've made it into an ATV park. I mean, parks plural, you know, this whole mountain ranges that for like a hundred bucks, you can buy this pass, which I bought. And that way they don't chase you off. <laughs> you know, it's, it's mainly for people to tear up the ground. I don't, I'm not interested in doing that. I just want to go in. There's certain things you can explore if they own it and you have this pass. So I did some of that around Ashland um, when I was out there last. Well, tell me if I'm right, because I did a little exploring and the main road, you know how that runs out of Ashland. Um, it looks like all the houses are over on the left side of a creek. It, it, did it run on the left side of what is now currently the main highway through that group of houses? Oh, you're, you're, you're heading back east. You're heading towards right, Gerardville? East, just out of Ashland towards Gerardville. Yeah. Yeah. That was, uh, well, the highway wasn't there. That was the single track car line where the highway is now. No road. And, right. Well, the road was on the left side of that creek where all the houses front. Yeah. Yeah. So the old maps that I've seen um, don't show any houses on the trolley side of the, of the stream. The tro trolley basically ran right along the edge of that. It's like, it's like a channelized Manoy Creek's, you know, man-made street right there. And there's one or two bridges. And I guess those are where the trolley stations were. People would walk from, the, from, that, from that row of houses. Mm -hmm. Mm. to catch the trolley mm -hmm. that's at least on those maps one thing about the maps i find a little troubling is that even if they're detailed they very seldom have a date on them or if they were drafted at one point they were revised so many times that you don't you can't always pin down when it was made but they're still you know and, and well, again like nine times out of ten there's nothing on them but every once in a while they're worth checking out mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Okay, well, uh, I want to thank everybody again for joining us for our last trolleyology of 2021. And thank you again to Mike for putting this together and Andrew for your commentary as well. And cool. if you have an idea for an upcoming trolleyology or uh, if you'd enjoy giving a program, please reach out to me. Uh, my email address is in the confirmation email that you got for this program tonight. Uh, we hope you can join us in the coming weeks. Uh, the next one will be next month, actually, on Zoom or in person for trolleys and toy trains. And thank you again, everybody. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you so very Bye. much. Night, Andy and Mike.